Throughout the Pokemon series, Game Freak has drawn inspiration for Pokemon designs from a huge variety of different sources. And many of those sources are different legends and stories from cultures all around the world. Today, we'll be looking at 10 Pokemon and their cultural origins. Number 1. Magikarp The cultural origin of Magikarp and its evolution, Gyarados, is fairly well known amongst the Pokemon community. As it is said that Magikarp and Gyarados were inspired by an ancient Chinese legend. This legend states that if a carp could leap over a certain waterfall, often referred to as the Dragon Gate, then it would transform into a mighty Chinese dragon. Magikarp also just happens to look like the carp seen in illustrations of this myth, with its red and gold coloring, and of course, Gyarados is the dragon. Without legs, but still. Number 2, Oddish. That seems kind of strange, huh? Like it's kind of odd, but not super odd, it's just kind of odd-ish. Oddish may not seem to be based on a real plant at first glance, but in fact, it is based on a plant that has been surrounded in myth for thousands of years. The Mandrake Plant. In medieval times, these plants were said to possess magical properties, which was due to the hallucinogenic effects that they would cause if consumed. At the time, the poisonous chemicals within the Mandrake Plant were perceived to be magic, and as a result, the church frowned upon the possession of mandrakes even though they were used in the Bible. And in 1431, Mandrake possession was actually one of the charges that led to Joan of Arc being burned as a witch. Mandrake roots are very thick and are often forked in a way that makes them resemble a human torso and legs, so many myths began to circulate that Mandrakes were in fact magical little people and not plants. This is shown in the design of Oddish as the Pokemon possesses human-like features. Number 3, Jirachi. Even though the concept of wishing on a star has been around for centuries in the West, it has also been a prominent part of many Asian cultures for just as long. The design of Jirachi with these charms and stuff seems to point to it being based specifically on the Japanese Star Festival, also called Tanabata. The story of Tanabata itself, like many other Japanese legends, has its origins in China with the tale called The Princess and the Cowherd. There are many versions of this story, but the version most commonly known in Japan is as follows. Orihime was the daughter of the King of Heaven. She lived in the sky where she would weave cloth for her father on the banks of the Milky Way, or Amanogawa, literally meaning River of Heaven. The princess worked so hard that she became lonely, and so her father introduced her to a cowherd named Hikoboshi from the other side of the river. The pair fell in love at first sight, and they soon married. Once married, however, the couple spent so much time together that they ceased to do any work. Orihime's cloth remained unwoven, and Hikoboshi's cows were left to wander across the heavens. After a while, the King of Heaven grew angry and used the Milky Way to separate the lovers, placing them on opposite sides and forbidding them to cross. Orihime was devastated and her tears eventually moved the King of Heaven to offer a compromise. The couple would be allowed to meet for one night a year, on the seventh day of the seventh month. If the weather was bad and the river flooded, however, the couple would be unable to cross it, and would have to wait another year to meet. So both of them would pray for good weather, and if they were able to meet, anyone who made a wish on that day would also have their wish granted. Orihime and Hikoboshi are represented in the night sky by Vega and Altair, two bright stars that are the highest in the sky during late summer. It is said that if the sky is clear, the stars will shine with many different colors, showing that Orihime and Hikoboshi have met successfully. China also has an equivalent of Tanabata, which is called Kixi, or Night of Sevens. It is held on the seventh day of the seventh month of the Chinese lunisolar calendar which this year falls upon August the 16th. Likewise, Jirachi awakens every 1,000 years and for seven days. In Japan, the date has since been adapted to fit the Gregorian calendar, thus making it July the 7th. However, some festivals are still held according to the Chinese calendar, and others, including the most famous held in Sendai, are scheduled around the 7th of August. 
Number 4, Cast Form. Cast Form is often considered to be an oddly designed Pokemon by many, and can change between forms based on the weather. To many non-Japanese players, this design choice does not make too much sense, but Cast Form's design is actually based on a type of Japanese charm called a Teru Teru Bozu. These charms are designed to bring good weather, more specifically, rain. The tradition has its earliest origins in the Haitian period, that being the years between 749 and 1185. It was adapted from a Chinese practice which involved putting the Teru Teru Bozu on the end of a broom to sweep good spirits your way. But it was Japanese farmers who began the more recognizable practice of hanging the figures, made of cloth or paper tied off with string, inside their houses as a prayer for good weather for their crops. During the Edo period, 1603 through 1868, the practice spread to the cities where it became popular with children. By this time, the figures were hung outside the house to prevent rain. Alternatively, hanging them upside down would apparently have the opposite effect, and encourage rain. And the Teru Teru Bozu remains a common sight in Japan to this day, though nowadays they are usually made of tissue paper and an elastic band. Number 5, Nose Pass. Now this one is probably a bit more obvious. The main design of Nose Pass and Probo Pass seems to be inspired from compasses, as evidenced by Probo Pass's iron filling mustache. And if you look at Probo Pass from the top, it's a giant compass. However, the actual appearance of these two Pokemon is based on the Moai, also known as the Easter Island Heads. The story behind them is the story of a little-known culture that flourished in isolation for centuries. Easter Island is one of the many islands of Polynesia located in the Southern Pacific Ocean. Since the late 19th century, it has belonged to Chile, and its name was coined by the Dutch explorer Jacob Roggeveen, who became the first European to discover the island on Easter Sunday of 1722. However, nobody is sure of what the original name of the island was. The modern Polynesian name for the island is Rapa Nui, but this wouldn't have been the name that the natives used at the time. It's not even known when the island was first settled, and this is still an ongoing debate between historians. However, it seems that the Moai specifically were produced from around 1250 to 1500. So what are the Moai and why were they made? There are 887 Moai in existence, most of them carved from a soft volcanic rock called Tuff. They're stylized figures with large heads, prominent features, and small bodies that are currently mostly underground. Their size varies, but the tallest one ever completed was over 10 meters in height. Mini Moai were buried in the ground up to shoulder height, which is where the misconception of them just being big heads originated from. Their construction process is still shrouded in mystery, with it still being unknown how the Moai were moved from the quarries that they were carved from to their final destinations on the coasts of the island. It is theorized that the statues represented deceased ancestors, whom the Rapa Nui believed were watching over them from the spirit world. It was thought that the living and the dead had kind of a symbiotic relationship. Through making offerings to the statues, the living could provide the dead with a better place in the afterlife, and in return, the dead could bestow good health and good fortune upon the living. It is for this reason that most Moai faced inland, away from the sea, the sea represented the spirit world, and the Moai were looking inwards, toward the world of the living. Nowadays, the Moai are very recognizable and have ended up in other video games, such as in the Easton Kingdom in Super Mario Land, and as the antagonist Do from Arkanoid. You can even roll up little Moais in Katamari. And of course, there's a Pokémon. Now, even though it may seem to some that it is only Nose Pass and not Probo Pass that fits the look of the Moai, Probo Pass also has its design inspiration rooted in the Moai, as both Probo Pass's hat and the eyes are lifted from the Moai statues. It's not common knowledge, but many Moai do indeed have cylindrical red hats, known as Pukau. These aren't often seen because, just like most of the other freestanding full-body Moai, Moai with Pukau were knocked down and have only been re-erected fairly recently. Similarly, it was discovered that the eye sockets of the Moai were designed to hold eyes made of coral. Some Moai have had their eyes restored in this way. This makes Probo Pass a more sensible evolution to Nose Pass, as Nose Pass's design makes us think of typical Moai, while Probo Pass is the restored, traditional version. Number 6, Bronzor and Bronzong. At first, Bronzor's design may not be that clear, or even Bronzong's for that matter. However, both have a pretty interesting origin story behind them. Bronzong is based on a bronze bell, or dotaku, 
while Bronze Zor is based on a bronze mirror, specifically a type that was manufactured in China around 2000 BC onwards, and eventually made its way to Japan around 300 AD. Both of these Pokémon together don't seem to make much sense, unless you've heard about a Japanese legend that is best known by the title of A Mirror and a Bell. It appears in a famous collection of stories entitled Kwaidan, Stories and Studies of Strange Things. The book was published in 1904 and was compiled by Lafcady O'Hearn, an Irish-Greek journalist who became a Japanese citizen. He produced many different accounts of Japanese culture and mythology that served to introduce the West to Japan and its culture. The story that concerns us begins hundreds of years prior in Muganyama in the Totomi province. There, the priests wanted a new bell for their temple, and asked for the local women to donate old bronze mirrors, so that they could be melted down and cast into a bell. One of the mirrors to be donated came from a farmer's wife. After a while though, she started to regret giving away her mirror, which had been in her family for many years. An old proverb said that the mirror was the soul of a woman, and she started to worry that in giving away her precious mirror, she had also given away her soul. She didn't have the money to buy the mirror back, and whenever she went to the temple, she could see it amongst the pile of the others. She longed to steal it back, but the opportunity never came. Eventually, all of the mirrors were sent to the foundry to be melted down. Mysteriously, one of the mirrors would not melt, a sign that whoever donated it must not have wanted to give it up. Since the offering wasn't presented with all her heart, the mirror remained attached to her kept cold in the furnace by her selfish desire. When it was discovered to whom the mirror belonged, the woman couldn't bear the shame and drowned herself. But before she died, she left a letter stating that once she was gone, the mirror could be melted and used to cast the bell. However, anybody who struck the bell hard enough to break it would be rewarded with riches by her ghost. The locals took this dying promise pretty seriously, as the last wishes of anyone dying in anger were thought to possess a mythical power. Thus, the possibility of breaking the bell and becoming rich seemed very real. Once the newly made bell was hung in the temple, people flocked to the temple to ring it, striking it as hard as they possibly could. The bell held firm, but still, people tried to break it, day after day. This proved hugely annoying for the priests, who had to endure the near-constant ringing of their bell. Soon tiring of the constant noise, the priests took the bell and rolled it down a hill into a deep swamp. The bell sank in, never to be seen again, and the woman, from far beyond the grave, had succeeded in destroying the bell that had caused her so much misery. Even though the bell was lost, many people broke other objects in substitute of the bell, in hopes of getting untold riches. However, in many versions of this legend, the financial reward came at the cost of a person's soul. They would gain riches in life, but be cast into a particularly nasty corner of hell upon dying. One reference to the legends in the design of Bronzor and Bronzong might not be immediately obvious, as it's in their abilities. Both can have the heat-proof ability, rendering them resistant to fire, just like the mirror that refused to be melted down. There are also a few vague references to the myths in their Pokedex entries. Bronzong, funnily enough, is mentioned to be a bringer of good harvests. And the Dotoku, the type of bell on which it's based, was used to pray for good harvests in ancient times. But the most mysterious entry for Bronzong has to be the one from Diamond. One caused a news sensation when it was dug up at a construction site after a 2,000 year sleep. Might this Bronzong then be the actual bell of Mugen, finally recovered from the swamp? If so, one should think twice about battling it. The payout upon defeating it may be unexpectedly high, but once it's game over, there'll be hell to pay. Number 7, Mawile. Mawile has a pretty cute design, aside from the gaping jaws that it possesses. However, those jaws have a pretty interesting backstory behind them. Japanese folklore contains many examples of yokai, or monsters. Some are evil, some are not so evil, and most of them are just mischievous. Some resemble animals, while others could pass for human. In fact, there are various yokai that, according to legend, started off as human before being transformed by various means into monsters. One such monster is the Futakuchi Ona, or Two-Mouthed Woman. As the name suggests, this is an otherwise normal woman, except she has a second mouth located in the back of her head. This mouth has a mind of its own. 
and the woman's hair is frequently depicted as forming tendrils under the mouth's control, grabbing items of food to feed it. Compare an illustration of the Futakuchi Ona to Mawile, and you can see the similarities. Mawile's jaws, though stated in the games to be formed from horns, actually resemble long black hair. In fact, fun fact, on most animals, horns are made of the same material as hair, just more condensed. Ma Wile's status as the Deceiver Pokémon also ties in with the myth. A Futakuchiona could masquerade as a perfectly ordinary woman, her true and frightening nature hidden from view most of the time. A further link is evident when considering Ma Wile's Japanese name, Kuchit. This combines Kuchi, meaning mouth, with the English word sheet. Ma Wile's English name carries this same meaning, made up of Ma, meaning mouth, and Wile, or Wily, meaning trickery. There are numerous stories detailing the origins of the Futakuchiona. The most common one is the cautionary tale of a miser. Not keen on paying for extra food, he married a woman who ate very little. However, he soon found that his stores of rice were being depleted at an alarming rate. Spying on his wife, he finally discovered the truth. A second mouth in the back of her head, consuming all of his food. In other versions of the story, the woman is normal when she marries, but after years of being starved by her miserly husband, the second mouth develops in an effort to keep her fed. And there are plenty of other much darker stories about the origins of the Futakuchiona, but I think we'll leave some of those ones out. Number 8, Frostlass, another Pokémon based on a yokai. Frostlass's Japanese name is Yuki Minoko, which is a combination of the Japanese word yuki, meaning snow, and Minoko, an archaic word for girl in Japanese. Kimeno also sounds like a corruption of the word kimono, a type of traditional Japanese dress. In fact, Frostlass's body appears to look like a kimono, and has a large sash around her body, which is known as an obi, which is worn in conjunction with a kimono. The origin of Frostlass's design is from a yokai called the Yukiona. Yukiona is said to appear on snowy nights and floats atop of the snow, as she has no feet. Most tales say that she will follow travelers caught in a snowstorm and will freeze them to death with an icy cold breath. Another version of this tale starts with two woodcutters, Minokichi, a young man, and Musaku, an old man. The two were unable to go back home due to a snowstorm and had to camp out in a hut on a mountain. Musaku woke up during the night to see a beautiful woman. Unfortunately, the woman froze Musaku and was going to do the same with Minokichi but she spared his life due to his young age. Because of this, she promised she would kill him if he told anyone about her. And considering that this is a legend, he told someone. Later in the future, Minokichi married a woman named Oyuki, and they had children together. One day, Minokichi brought up a topic that eventually resulted in Oyuki reminding him about the snow spirit he saw that day. Oyuki became suddenly angry with him. As it turned out, that she was that same snow spirit and was ready to kill him. However, she began to think about their children and decided to melt away instead, with her final words being, take care of our children. Frost Lass lives in snowy environments and has the ability to freeze foes with its very icy cold breath. Some of its Pokedex entries say it would display its victims secretly after freezing them, and in the anime it can create illusions to manipulate others. Frostlass is also a female-only species, and is said to be the spirit of a woman who was lost in the snowy peaks of the mountains. Sounds awfully familiar to the myth surrounding Yukiona, doesn't it? Number 9, one of the Sun-exclusive Ultra Beasts is Kartana, and Ultra Beasts, as it turns out, spoilers, are just Pokémon from Ultra Space. Kartana is a small origami Pokémon that can cut down a steel tower with just one swing. This Pokémon both relates to the Japanese practice of origami and the code of samurai. Origami in Japan started in the Edo period of the 1600s, where it was used like a greeting card to people. The design of Kartana is modeled around the use of modular origami, which was developed in 1734. Modular origami is focused on more elaborate shapes and three-dimensional objects. One of the prime examples is forming cubes and kusudamas. The Japanese name of Kartana, Kamitsurugi, is taken from the Japanese words for katana and art. A katana is one of the most common weapons wielded by the samurai, and the combination of katana and art shows that this Ultra Beast's deadly precision is beautiful, much like the way some samurais dance with their swords. And number 10, Celesteela. 
Celestila's name in Japan is Tekaguya, which may be a combination of Teka, meaning gunfire, Teko, steel, and Kaguyahime, a princess from a very old Japanese story, which is actually very sad, named the Tale of the Bamboo Cutter. And also note that Celestila looks like bamboo that was cut with a sword. For those unfamiliar, Tale of the Bamboo Cutter depicts the story of a tiny baby girl found inside a bamboo by a pair of married woodcutting people, who then raise her as their own child and name her Kaguya. She grows up to be a beautiful woman and has several suitors, but she tells all of them that if they wish to marry her, they must accomplish the impossible task of obtaining legendary items. Of course, none of them succeeded. Later, she reveals that she comes from the moon and was sent to Earth. Depending on different versions of the story, she either came to Earth to avoid a war happening on the moon, or was exiled temporarily for a crime she committed. Her parents, and the Emperor of Japan, try to keep her from returning to the moon, as its emissaries are coming to take her back. They failed. So Kaguya tearfully said goodbye to her foster parents before returning to the moon. Kaguya is also the nickname of a Japanese satellite known as Selene, which orbited the moon for about two years from 2007 to 2009. This is most likely where Celestila gets its steel typing from, as well as its spaceship-like design, complete with rockets. However, it also appears that Celestila is wearing a multi-layered kimono, and appears to have very female-looking facial features on her tiny little face, which draws influence from Princess Kaguya. And there you have it. There's 10 Pokemon cultural origins. Should I do 10 more? Let me know some of your favorite Pokemon origins down below. And also, check this shirt out! Oh, it's so cool! It's alchemy and Pokemon at the same time! Awesome! You can pick up these shirts by using the link in the description, which also has lots of other shirts from this channel. Wow! <laughs> and until next time, please remember to never stop using your noggin.